Uh, hi everyone, uh, thank you, thank you all for coming. Uh, my name is Maciej Matuszewski and I am one of the uh, co-secretaries of the Northeast branch of the Institute of Physics. And it is my uh, great pleasure uh, to, uh, to welcome you to, to, this, uh, to, to this talk. Uh, just some uh, very brief housekeeping. There will be time at the end for some questions. Uh, it'd be great if you can submit any, any, any questions using the question and answer uh, feature, uh, which, which you should see uh, uh, on the on the bar on the bottom of your Zoom window, uh, depending on your operating system, it, it may actually be on top on the side, but usually it's on the bottom. Uh, you you should also have ac access to to the chat functionality. Uh, it's it's better that you use the, the Q and A for questions. Although if you have maybe some urgent technical issues, then perhaps you can put them uh, in the chat. Uh, and the the talk and questions we expect will last uh, about an hour. Uh, so, it is my uh, very great pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Professor Paula Chadwick from uh, Durham University, uh, who is uh, an, an expert in uh, gamma ray astronomy, and Professor Chadwick will give a talk entitled Ground-Based Gamma Ray Astronomy and the Cherenkov Telescope Array, which will give an introduction to what Cherenkov telescopes are and discuss the applications. Uh, thank you, thank you for coming to speak to us. Thank you, Matthew. So I'm going to try and um, share my screen in the usual way. Um, we should all have got used to this by now, but here we go. Uh, so I hope that is working and I hope we've got a slideshow. So there's full screen now. Someone like to just let me know they're OK. Yeah, all full screen. Excellent. Thank you very much. OK, so um, as advertised, I'm going to talk about uh, what I spend my time doing, uh, which is ground based um, gamma ray astronomy. Uh, I'm just going to hide you all. Um, so what am I going to do? Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about non thermal radiation and uh, then cosmic rays. I will briefly mention gamma ray astronomy from space. And then um, I'm going to talk about gamma ray astronomy from the ground, um, how it works, um, what the current instruments are. Um, and that thing that we're trying to build and have been for some time now, um, the Cherenkov Telescope Array. And I'll finish just very briefly mentioning a little bit of the science that we can do um, with CTA. So, um, as most of you probably know, um, in most cases, what most astronomers or varieties of astronomy are doing is observing thermal radi radiation. Essentially, they're looking at things that glow because in some sense or other they're, they're hot or at least warmer than the background. So you can see there various pictures of uh, the sky um, with the, the plane of our galaxy across the middle at all sorts of different wavelengths. And uh, you can see the, the, the view of the sky varies a bit, but, you know, um, you can see all sorts of different things. But the thing is that not all radiation can be thermal in origin. So if you work out for radio waves, how cold an object would be if those were to be produced thermally, then you come out with a temperature that is colder than the background temperature of the universe, in other words, around minus 300 degrees centigrade. Then when you look at the other end of the electromagnetic spectrum, when we look at the most energetic gamma rays, we need temperatures around about 10 to the 15 degrees to produce those thermally, and we haven't seen those since the Big Bang. So clearly we need some other way of producing this radiation. And the answer is particle acceleration. So what this tells us is that there's a whole bunch of particle accelerators, like uh, things we get at CERN, only much, much bigger. Um, and what's more, actually, we get to see the particles that they've accelerated. Um, these are known as cosmic rays. So it's kind of a requirement, I think, every time you mention cosmic rays, to show the picture that you can see on the bottom right. Um, so cosmic rays were discovered in uh, 1912 um, by Victor Hess and his co-worker Kohlhurster. Um, and uh, this all came about because people at the time were starting to work on radiation. And they noticed there was clearly some background radiation. They would put photographic plates, for example, away um, and bring them out and discover that clearly there had been some exposure to radiation. And not unreasonably, they thought that the radiation was coming from the rocks beneath their feet. So Hess and Kulhurst had devised this experiment whereby they would test this out. So what they did was they took 
a very simple radiation detector, a gold leaf electroscope, and some of you may be old enough to remember having those at school, I certainly do. And they took a very simple form, this radiation detector, and uh, they took it up to height. And what they expected to see was the amount of radiation decreasing with height. And that is indeed what happened. And then it started to increase again, which led them to conclude that not only was there indeed some radiation coming from the rocks beneath our feet, but there was also radiation coming from space. And this was dubbed cosmic rays. And you can see there, there's a picture of, of Hess in much, much later life on a, on a stamp there from uh, Austria. If you look at the picture of Hess there, you can see he looks like he's dressed for a Sunday afternoon out. Um, there's no oxygen, for example, no specialist equipment. And he went as high as five kilometers in these balloons. He nearly died on two occasions, um, but he also got the Nobel Prize. So, you know, maybe it was kind of worth it. So these charged particles, they're very energetic and they're bombarding the earth all the time. So the most energetic of these particles have the same energy as a tennis ball moving at 100 miles an hour, um, which is a Scottish colleague of mine likes to say, that's Andy Murray's second serve, uh, or at least it was anyway. What you can see there on the right hand side is a picture that shows you the typical spectrum that we get. Um, so we usually have the log of the flux of particles going up uh, on the, the y-axis and the log of the energy going along on the x-axis. And we get this thing which is known as a power law spectrum, where the number of particles um, is proportional to the energy to some power. Mostly what we get are protons, um, but we do also see heavier nuclei, helium, all the way up to things like iron and nickel. So the difficulty is explaining where these things come from, because the cosmic rays are charged particles and our galaxy's got a magnetic field. So they have a nasty habit of not traveling towards us in straight lines. However, wherever you accelerate particles to extreme energy, you will also produce photons, gamma rays. These, of course, are uncharged and they travel in a straight line. And so these act as tracers for particle acceleration within the universe. All we have to do is catch the gamma rays, and simple enough. So here is a picture of the electromagnetic spectrum, um, just to give you some idea of where we are with, with gamma rays. So when we think about this really energetic radiation, we stop thinking in terms of frequency and wavelength, because as you can see, the numbers get a little bit silly. Um, and we start to talk in terms of electron volts. Um, so typical optical radiation, as you probably all know, is around about one electron volt. Um, the sort of thing that I do, um, we're working from something around the order of 10 to the 10 electron volts or 10 to the 9 electron volts, somewhere between there, right the way up to infinity-ish, um, wherever we get to. Um, and this actually covers a big chunk of the electromagnetic spectrum. So essentially everything beyond around about um, 511 keV, half an MeV, everyone says, oh, well, these are gamma rays, but actually this covers a, a huge range of the spectrum. And therefore you need many different techniques in order to detect them. I'm gonna confine myself to being towards the top end. So I'm gonna talk about what we call the high energy gamma rays and what I'm interested in, the very high energy gamma rays. So, as I said, gamma ray covers an enormous energy range. Um, for astronomers, um, there are several problems. Um, first of all, you can't focus gamma rays. It's possible to focus an X-ray by skipping it off the surface of a highly polished mirror um, with suitably high atomic number. Um, just like you would get a, a pebble off the surface of water, for example, but you simply can't do that with gamma rays. They go through everything. One thing they don't get quite the way through, however, is the Earth's atmosphere. So that's a plus. Um, we do not, in fact, have death from space raining down on us. Um, we are protected from the gamma rays by the Earth's atmosphere. The other problem for astronomers is that gamma rays are very rare, um, and that suggests that we need quite a large instrument in order to be able to detect them. So the other thing you might want to do is get your telescope above the Earth's atmosphere, so it gets us to somewhere where the gamma rays are not absor uh, absorbed. And at the moment, we have a telescope called the Fermi Gamma Ray Space Telescope, Fermi for short, uh, which is, is operating and doing some great work. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side there, there's a sort of artist's impression of what it might look like. Um, it sort of looks like that, but without all the pretty stuff behind, I think. 
Um, it's named after Enrico Fermi, um, who won the Nobel Prize for Physics in 1938. Naturally, when I was putting the slide together, um, I didn't realize how young he was when he died. He was only 53. Um, but I do like his, his uh, comment there at the bottom. Um, before I came here, I was confused about this subject. Having listened to your lecture, I am still confused, but on a higher level. Um, so I'm going to try and confuse you on a higher level tonight. And just because everybody likes a nice picture of a rocket launch, there was a launch of Fermi on June the 11th, 2008. So it's been operating for over 13 years now and doing a, a very good job. Um, for those of you who like some technical details, this is what's in the um, large area telescope on board. And um, there's also a, a gamma ray burst monitor, which I'm not going to talk about on, on board the instrument. Um, so it consists of an anti-coincident shield, um, which is essentially a scintillator uh, that is designed to note when a charged particle has come through towards the telescope. And these that are then vetoed out of the analysis because we're interested in the gamma rays, not in the cosmic rays. Um, then we have a tracker. Um, which is a series of converters of plates of metal and silicon strip detectors. And um, what these do is when the incoming gamma ray um, hits them, we get an electron positron pair produced. And the point of the trackers then is to track where the electron and positron pairs go and therefore to work out where the gamma ray has come from. And right at the bottom, um, there's a calorimeter uh, made of scintillators, cesium iodide and some photodiodes to measure the amount of light. And the amount of light you get gives you an idea of the energy of the original gamma ray that came in. And there are four towers like that illustration on the top right there. And you can see on the bottom right, some people um, ferreting about and trying to sort out the instrument before its launch. So as I say, it has been incredibly successful. Um, this is a picture um, of the way things look from Fermi with just a five year exposure actually. Um, at energies above one giga electron volts, so that's 10 to the 9 EV. Um, and you can see the galactic plane along the middle looking bright, lots of sources of gamma rays in there, and then lots of things dotted about elsewhere that are by and large the extra galactic sources. Um, they've now released the 10-year um, catalogue uh, known as the 4FGL DR2, DR2 standing for Data Release 2. Um, that was released last year, and there are over 5,000 objects in this catalogue, and that really is uh, an order of magnitude improvement over what we had before. So this all looks great, uh, but there's a problem. So Fermi can detect gamma rays from around about 100 MeV um, to around about 100 GeV. Now, there's nothing to stop it, actually going higher than that in terms of energy. But the problem is the detector is very small. It's only about a square meter in area. And these most energetic gamma rays are very rare. So that means it's very difficult for a space-based detector to go to much higher energy than that. What you actually need to have is a detector about the size of two football pitches, um, which I think we have to say is not something that's going to be terribly easy to launch. Um, so it's pretty clear that if you want to get to the really high energy gamma rays, you're going to need to do something else. So happily, um, there's a bit of physics that comes to our rescue. And this is Cherenkov light. So Cherenkov light or Cherenkov radiation is produced when a charged particle exceeds the velocity of light in a medium. This is, of course, not exceeding the velocity of light in a vacuum, which, as far as we know, you cannot do. When this happens, the electromagnetic waves cannot get away from the object that's moving faster than the object is moving through it. So what you end up with is a kind of wake is produced. So this is a bit like a speedboat producing a wake on water. When a speedboat is going faster than the natural speed of the waves on the water, they collect in this wake around the nose of the boat. Also similar to a jet fighter breaking the sonic barrier with the sonic boom. Um, again, the sound wave simply cannot get away from the jet fighter fast enough. Um, you get an accumulation of, of these um, sound waves that create the sonic boom. In a nuclear reactor core, we can see this nice blue light, which is Cherenkov radiation, um, when you see charged particles going faster than the speed of light in water. And uh, there's a picture there of some nice blue Cherenkov radiation. Now, it turns out this also happens in the air. 
because obviously light goes a bit more slowly in the air than it does in a vacuum. And I don't really expect you to read this whole long quote. Um, but basically, there was a realization that these cosmic rays that they, they knew about and had known about for um, what 40 years by then, um, these mysterious cosmic rays should produce Cherenkov of light in the upper atmosphere. But what they didn't realize is that actually this Cherenkov of light should be distinguishable from the general mush of radiation because it occurs in pulses caused by extensive air showers. And so that's where we're going to go next. So when a charged particle or indeed a gamma ray comes into the upper atmosphere, what it does is to create a cascade of particles. And uh, we're going to show you an animation here. This is from the University of Chicago. This is therefore Chicago. Um, I should say that Chicago does not, in fact, have a box above it. Um, but you're going to see now a simulation that comes in. Actually, this is a cosmic ray coming in, producing all this sort of shrapnel, uh, which ultimately will produce the Cherenkov radiation. But the point is that this shrapnel produces a sort of front of energetic particles that will land all within a relatively short period of time and create their Cherenkov radiation all within a relatively short period of time. And now the people who did the simulation are just showing off, so we'll move on. So we get a very high energy gamma ray. We get a cascade of energetic charged particles in the atmosphere. And these in turn will produce Cherenkov radiation, which is a flash of blue light. Can't see it with the naked eye. First of all, it's very faint. It constitutes about one ten thousandth of the total starlight. The other thing is that the pulses produced by the air showers are very short, a matter of a few nanoseconds, a few billionths of a second. And that's really important. It's important because nothing else in nature produces such rapid flashes of light in the atmosphere. Lightning, for example, is typically milliseconds or even microseconds in duration. So if you tune your detector appropriately to look for these really rapid flashes, you are able to distinguish them from the general background. So here is the first ever ground-based gamma ray telescope. It was created in Harwell at AERE um, by John Jelly and uh, Tom Gold. Um, and essentially, Gamma ray telescopes have not changed a great deal. So first of all, we like to get our hands on the biggest mirror we can because the terrain of light is rather faint. Um, in the case of, of this telescope, um, it was an army surplus searchlight mirror um, purchased down Tottenham Court Road. Um, in 1954, these things were quite readily available. The next thing we need is a high speed light detector. And that thing that looks like a little tin can is in fact a photomultiplier tube. And we'll talk a bit more about those later. They are still used in Cherenkov telescopes, so they're not quite all of them. And then what we need is we need an amplifier and we need some high-speed electronics in order to process the signal that we get. Um, there are one or two features of a Jelly and Gold telescope that we don't currently have in most instruments. Um, first of all, you can see there there's a laboratory standard issue um, clamp stand. Uh, we don't have those, um, nor do we surround our telescopes with a dustbin, uh, which is what's around that searchlight mirror. The bit I always like about Jelly and Girls' experiment is that when they pointed this towards the sky and they could see the drink of pulses coming in on their oscilloscope, um, they were able to demonstrate that they clearly were coming from the night sky by simply putting the lid on the dustbin. I do like that. OK, so that all sounds great, but as you've probably realised from what I've been saying, not only do gamma rays produce Cherenkov light in the atmosphere, but so do cosmic rays. Um, we want to study the gamma rays. We want to look at that Cherenkov light. But the problem is the cosmic rays just produce a huge background of many, many more Cherenkov events. So we have a problem of trying to pick out the gamma rays from this background of cosmic rays. So how do we do that? Well, it turns out that the physics of the showers that we get created in the upper, upper atmosphere are different, and that imprints itself on the Cherenkov radiation that we see on the ground. So a gamma ray is what's known as a pure electromagnetic shower. It consists only of photons, electrons, and positrons. 
And consequently, what we get is a rather neat and tidy Cherenkov flash on the ground. As you can see on the left there, that's a gamma ray shower. And if your telescope is placed somewhere within that Cherenkov light flash, most likely what it will see in the, te in the telescope is, a, is an ellipse. For a hadronic cosmic ray, which is what you can see on the right, what we get is a whole pile of all sorts of things. We have local muons and we do have an electromagnetic component. We have a hadronic component. It's just a mess. And consequently, the Cherenkov light that we see is also something of a mess. Um, and that means that we can actually distinguish the gamma rays from the cosmic rays actually rather well. So what we end up with is something called the Imaging Atmospheric Cherenkov Technique, which I know is a little bit of a mouthful. So in comes our gamma ray, produces some Cherenkov light actually about 10 kilometers above sea level. Uh, this then lands on the ground as a sort of pool. We then take a picture of it with a rather simple camera, usually consisting of order of 500 to 1,000 individual pixels, nothing as good as your phone camera, for example. Um, and we image the Cherenkov flight that we see. The nice thing is that the long axis of that shower is reflected in the long axis of the ellipse that we see. So that gives us some directional information. But as you probably spotted, all that tells us is the source of the gamma rays is somewhere along that dotted line. So what we actually do is we have several telescopes um, that we can then use to triangulate on where the gamma rays come from. And one nice effect of that actually is that we have much better angular resolution than space-based instruments. Um, and we can now reject well over 99% of the cosmic rays. So we've solved our background problem with this imaging atmospheric Cherenkov technique. So um, there are some telescopes currently operating um, in the uh, Northern Hemisphere. We have MAGIC, which is on the island of La Palma. That's two telescopes, um, each around 17 meters in diameter. Um, then we have Veritas, which is in Arizona, four telescopes, and they are around 12 meters in diameter. And then the top right there, you can see Hess, which is in Namibia, and that consists of five telescopes. Four of them are about 12 meters in diameter, and the huge great one in the middle, which looks like somebody sort of photoshopped it in, it is real, um, is, well, depends how you measure it because it's not quite round, but it's around about um, 30 meters at its greatest extent. Now, like most telescopes, these need to be somewhere high and dry. Um, as I mentioned, the Cherenkov flight has developed about 10 kilometers above sea level, and most clouds are well below that. So um, we can't be observing when there's cloud and, and we really don't like our mirrors to be rained on too much. So the catalog so far, as of, of last week when I checked, um, we know of, of around about 250 sources of gamma rays detected from the ground. So these are the very energetic objects. Um, a lot of them are as yet unidentified. It's quite hard to identify what some of these um, gamma ray sources actually are. There's a big bunch of galactic sources, lots of pulsars um, and supernova remnants. And for many years, we've assumed the supernova remnants are probably the source of the cosmic rays in our galaxy, and that looks like it may well be the case. Outside our galaxy, the vast majority of what we see are active galactic nuclei, um, which we'll talk about a bit more later. If you put the uh, high energy sky from Fermi together with the very high energy sky, you get something that looks a bit like this. The, the blobs are the, the very energetic sources. So you can see once again, we see the galactic plane very clearly outlined. But you'll also notice perhaps more clearly the things that are seen with the space-based instruments are not with the ground-based instruments. But there are also things which are seen with the ground-based instruments that are not seen with the space-based instruments. So it's not quite so simple as to say, oh, well, you see it from space and then you see it at higher energies from the ground. It's not actually the case. So we really like a new instrument. Like all astronomers, we're terribly greedy. We always want something better. We like better sensitivity at low energies because we want to be able to overlap with the satellite-based instruments. At the moment, there's a gap between where the satellites kind of run out of, of photons and where we start with the ground-based instruments. And that gap is difficult because we want to be able to bring our two measurements together to, to uh, cross correlate them. Um, we'd like better sensitivity at medium energy so we can see further basically. So for us medium energies are around about one tera electron volt, that's about 10 to the 12 electron volts, gives you an idea where we're sitting at. Um, 
We would like also to look at the unexplored extremely energetic region. And there we're talking about around 100 tera electron volts, so 10 to the 14 EV. And that's really crucial for understanding particle acceleration in these systems. We'd like better angular resolution. I said it was better than we get in space. We could still do with it being better still. We'd like to be able to see structures, for example, in supernova remnants, which we can just about do now, but we'd like to be able to do it better. We'd like a wider field of view, partly to enable us to survey. There's actually never been a complete survey of the sky at these energies. So we're clearly missing some stuff. And also it actually gives us better control of our, our background if we can see a bit more of it. So the next big step for us is the Cherenkov Telescope Array, or CTA. It's kind of the world's very high energy gamma ray telescope. We're looking to explore this top four to five decades in energy, um, give ourselves a factor of about 10 improvement on, on current telescopes, full sky coverage by having an array in the Northern Hemisphere, an array in the Southern Hemisphere, and uh, we hope a large community of users. Um, so this is where we're seeking the two arrays. Um, one is uh, going to be on La Palma, um, and the other one is going to be at Paranal in Chile. Actually, the site is technically called Amazonas. It's not far from the European Southern Observatory, and we are piggybacking to some extent off their infrastructure. Um, we also had a couple of uh, backup sites, one in Mexico and one in Namibia, but uh, I think the dies are cast and we're starting to dig holes. So um, it's Chile and it's La Palma for us. So I did say we've started digging holes and things. Um, so this is um, one variety of telescope we're building. We're building three types. Uh, the large size telescopes are 23 meters in diameter, and they're designed to cover the low energy range. You need a big mirror, low energy is because you don't get very many Cherenkov photons. Uh, but there are more of these uh, gamma rays, so you can get away with slightly fewer telescopes. And um, so we're looking at having four of these telescopes initially on La Palma. Um, we hope eventually to, to gather the funds to put some in the Southern Hemisphere as well. Um, this is the, uh, the prototype telescope on La Palma. Uh, these telescopes are so large that you don't really build a prototype and then throw it away and say, well, let's build another four. You, you build your first one and then fix any issues and then build the other three. Um, medium sized telescopes, these are really the workhorses of the observatory. Initially, there'll be nine of these in the Northern Hemisphere site and 14 in the Southern Hemisphere site. Um, we wouldn't put a telescope here. Um, this is near Berlin, actually, where the prototype was built to check it, uh, it all works. And uh, now they're just waiting to put it somewhere. And finally, the small size telescopes. These are, these are the ones in which we in Durham and the UK in general are involved. These are designed for the highest energy gamma rays. So that's 100 TeV region that I was talking about. Um, there will be 37 of these in, in Chile initially. Um, and the primary mirror that you can see there is four meters in diameter. That's all the hexagons that you can see. Um, this prototype telescope is actually um, halfway up Mount Etna, um, which might seem to be a slightly eccentric place to put a telescope. Uh, but I will say those little domes there are an observatory that's been there since the 19th century, Cerro la Nave. And uh, our Italian colleagues tell us that it's never been hit by lava. So we're hoping that is in fact true. But you can probably tell when I mentioned primary mirrors, the design of this telescope is a little bit different from the usual. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, so a standard Cherenkov telescope has a, this single big mirror, uh, usually made out of multiple individual hexagonal mirrors, and it's called a Davis cotton design. And uh, actually it was originally developed in 1957 for solar furnaces. Um, and the point about it is that it gives you quite a large field of view, around about four degrees across, and bear in mind the full moon's half a degree, um, with reasonably good image quality across it. And I mentioned our pixels were quite coarse and fairly big. And in fact, what we're trying to image is not astronomical objects, but the Cherenkov light, which is about a degree across. So we don't need fantastically good mirrors. So we have these spherical form mirrors on a parabolic form frame to make the Davis cotton system. However, when you want to get to a bigger field of view, the camera starts to get to be a silly size. So the picture you can see on the right hand side there is the prototype medium sized telescope with their camera, um, which has a field of view of I think five degrees across. And you can see all the people standing in front of it and you can see just how big the camera is. If you want to double that field of view, well, just imagine we're going to have an enormous camera. So the, the camera starts to dominate your entire telescope. 
Um, so we need to think of another way of doing things. So the design that we're using is something called a Schwarzschild Coude design. And it was described in a, a series of papers by Schwarzschild in 1905, actually. Um, and it gives you a wide field of view with quite good off-axis performance, but with a small camera. Um, and this is done by using two mirrors that sort of face each other, as you can see uh, at the bottom left there. It was never built, um, partly because the optics are hard to manufacture. They're highly aspherical. Uh, and also the engineering tolerances are rather tight if you're going to build this and beyond what was possible in 1905. But nonetheless, the theory was good. Um, and this whole design was rediscovered by gamma ray astronomers in 2006. So that's what we're building. The next question is, what do we do about our detectors? Um, so you can't use a CCD, which most astronomers would use because they're far too slow. Again, we're looking at things that last a matter of nanoseconds. Um, CCDs can't cope with that. And also they're not sensitive enough in the blue, actually. Most of them are good in the red, but not so much in the blue. Remember, Cherenkov light is mostly blue. So we most commonly use those photomultiplier tubes, as I mentioned, that were used right back in 1954 in the very first telescope. And the reason we like to use them is they're very fast. They're, the rise time of the pulse you get from them is around about a nanosecond. They have really good blue ultraviolet sensitivity. The ultraviolet kind of comes in theory um, and it's easy to get a large area. Um, so you can see a picture at the bottom there that shows you what they look like. They're basically a vacuum tube, instant light comes in, um, hits some metal, um, the, the dynode, uh, that will give you secondary electrons. They then hit another dynode and more electrons are created and so on and so forth until we get a pulse of electrons at the other end. So they just use the photoelectric effect. But there are problems with this. First of all, they're glass vacuum tubes. And if you drop one, then I'm afraid you've broken it. Um, also, this reduces the UV sensitivity because in general, the windows are glass. And of course, most UV doesn't get very far through glass. Um, if you want a UV sensitive um, photomultiplier tube, you have to put a quartz window on, which is expensive. The photocathode can be completely wrecked by exposure to bright light. So if you leave one of these things switched on and then go and switch on the lights in your laboratory, um, you have also broken your photomultiplier tube and many people have. They're not that efficient. They're only about 25% efficient. They require a, a high voltage supply, which again is not always ideal. And they're sensitive to magnetic fields. So as, uh, as they change their, um, their orientation relative to the Earth's magnetic field, um, then you get a slight change in the signal. The nice thing about these Swarthschild Kude telescopes I was talking about is because they use a smaller camera, they can exploit smaller, more efficient things called silicon photomultipliers. So that's what we're going to use. Um, for those of you who are electronic geeks, these are avalanche photodiodes operated in Geiger mode. Um, so we have thin layers of silicon operating very near the breakdown voltage, and they will give very rapid response to the arrival of a, a photon, basically. Um, advantages are, well, they're very robust, uh, both physically, I wouldn't like to drop them, but I, they would survive better than a photomultiplier tube, uh, and to light, you can expose them to bright light and you don't break them. They have a low operating voltage, they're much more efficient, they're at least twice as efficient as a photomultiplier tube, and they're not sensitive to magnetic fields. The disadvantages are they are small, um, so this is why we can only really use them on these small sized telescopes. Um, you have to tile many of them together to make a decent sized detector. And for us, they're actually a little bit too sensitive in the red, which can give us some night sky background problems. And also sometimes um, they produce their own photons from the um, electrons produced by the photon coming in, which gives us something called optical crosstalk. So we sometimes have to deal with that. But we're building a camera using such technology. It's the um, small size telescope camera, the SSD camera for CTA. This is the UK's major contribution. Um, it involves colleagues in, in Leicester, Durham, Oxford and Liverpool, and I say also involved, making a very big contribution, our colleagues in Germany, Japan, Australia, and the, the Netherlands. Um, Bayes, our laws and masters, have committed to provide 13 of the initial 37 cameras from the UK, um, although we've, we've yet to actually see the money. So this is what it looks like. Um, this is the SST camera, it's a little modular design, it's a cube of size about 40 centimetres. So that shows you how much smaller you can make these cameras using the Schwarzschild Kude telescope design. It's modular, it's got 32 silicon PMs, each with 64 individual pixels. So that gives us 2048 pixels with full charge and time resolution. So we get some absolutely fabulous pictures from it. 
And here we go, it works. So we stuck it back in 2019 before a certain pandemic event happened um, on the telescope halfway up Mount Etna. And these are the images that you get. So on the right is the integrated image. Um, and on the left is actually the time resolved image. And for those of us who've been in the game a very long time, those images on the left were quite extraordinary because we'd never been able to see how the Cherenkov flight tracked across our cameras before. We just got the sort of pictures that you can see on the right hand side. So there's tons of information in all that. So having found the prototype works rather nicely. Um, we're now working on the final production model before we go on to, to building the rest of them. So having talked about the tacky stuff, I'm going to spend the last quarter of an hour or so um, just talking a little bit about the science that we get. Um, so there's a whole book called Science with the Cherenkov Telescope Array, which um, is a fascinating read. Well, it is to me, it may not be to you. But anyway, if you want to learn much more, um, you can have a look at that book. You can get it free for nothing um, from the uh, CTA website. Um, not as a physical book, as a PDF download, I should say. Um, so there are three essential themes to what we're trying to do. One is cosmic particle acceleration. So this is kind of the roots of the field. You know, where are these particles accelerated? How do they get to us? Um, and how do they impact the environment in space? The next theme is looking at probing extreme environments. So I mentioned that, that pulsars were important um, sources of gamma rays. So this enables us to probe what's happening near neutron stars, what's happening near black holes, what's happening in these jets of materials and these great explosions that we see in space. And also things called cosmic voids where we don't seem to see as much as we might expect. But what's going on there? And the third theme is looking at physics frontiers, um, which is the one I'm going to probably talk most about, um, looking at physics beyond the standard model. So what is the nature of dark matter? How is it distributed? Is the speed of light constant for high energy photons? And do axion light particles, which are a, a potential um, dark matter candidate, do, do they actually exist? To do all that, we have a number of what we call key science programs. So these are things that will take up most of the observatory's life in the first five years or so. Um, surveying, um, following transient events and all sorts of things like that. So this is basically what we're, what we're up to. So first of all, I'm going to start with the active galactic nuclei. I promised I would talk about those. Um, active galactic nuclei are basically galaxies containing a supermassive black hole that is a messy eater. So we think that, that essentially all galaxies, all, all large galaxies anyway, contain a supermassive black hole at the centre, including our own. Uh, but our own is quiet. It's not really eating very much at the moment. Um, but where black holes do eat material from their galaxies, what we tend to see is these relativistic jets squirting out from the black hole. Now you might ask quite reasonably, how do we get jets out from a black hole? We thought they ate everything, to which the response is, we're not entirely sure actually. Uh, we usually have to invoke magnetic fields and you always know an astrophysicist is confused when they invoke a magnetic field. Some of these objects are oriented such that the jet is or into close to our line of sight. And these are known as the blazars. So this is like looking down the barrel of a gun and we see extremely energetic radiation from these objects. So the extra galactic gamma ray sky is actually dominated by these objects known as the blazars. And we also see a few other things like radio galaxies and some starburst galaxies. A couple of our key science projects, the extra galactic survey and some targeted AGN observations will be looking at those. And an important question for us is, does the emission come from accelerated electrons or does it come from accelerated protons? So I mentioned to you that the cosmic rays are mostly protons. So if we're going to pin down where the extra galactic cosmic rays come from, we know there have to be some, then we really want to get some idea that there are protons being accelerated in these objects. Um, but actually, we can produce much of the radiation that we see just as well by accelerating electrons. And in many ways, they're a bit easier to accelerate because they're much less massive, of course. Um, so looking at the really energetic radiation that comes from these objects gives us a hint um, because you see slightly different radiation depending on whether you've got proton acceleration or electron acceleration. So that's one of the things that we really want to do with the active galaxies, try and pin down these cosmic rays. So we'll do a lot of this with an electric galactic survey. Um, so this is a blind survey of 25% of the sky. It's that sort of light blue kind of triangle that you can see. Um, it's the first time it's ever happened. 
uh, and it's be the first unbiased, very high energy extra galactic source catalog. So normally what happens um, is one of these objects goes into a high state. They produce these tremendous outbursts of radiation. All the ground based astronomers get terribly overexcited and we all rush off and observe it, which is great. But that means we have a tendency to observe things only when they're exploding, <laughs> which is it's not really the best way to perhaps understand the physics. So we want to have a, an unbiased survey of what's going on. And we produce a high resolution map of the extra galactic sky from around 50 giga electron volts to around 10 tera electron volts, perhaps a bit more. And this will take us about a thousand hours of data um, down to six millicrabs. People who like to th think in crabs might be interested to know that. I mentioned that we, we see these objects producing this transient radiation. We're not going to ignore the transients. We're going to do lots of follow-up observations of things like gamma ray bursts, galactic transients, um, high energy neutrino transients. I can talk a great deal about the neutrino stuff if you, if you want me to, but they're quite interesting. And of course, gravitational wave events. One of the important ways in which we can identify uh, objects within gravitational wave events is by looking for electromagnetic radiation as well as the gravitational wave events. And we expect there will be some transients that we'll see at very high energies first, actually, um, now that we're doing surveys. So we'll do a, a transient survey looking for these transient objects. But very often, particularly with things like the gravitational wave telescopes and the neutrino telescopes, you don't get terribly good information about where things are. So what we have is this rather clever system whereby the telescopes all point in a slightly different place to cover a much larger field of view so we can actually pick up where these transients are coming from. One of the most um, important and interesting transients are the gamma ray bursts. Um, these are bright bursts of gamma rays that pop up unpredictably all over the sky. Um, they were first detected with the Vela series of military satellites, in fact, in the 1960s, 70s. Um, and what these satellites were doing was looking for people um, who were testing nuclear weapons. Um, and they were expecting these to produce a burst of gamma rays and they'd be able to see what was going on from space. They saw lots of bursts of gamma rays, but the trouble was that they were all coming from outer space and not from um, the ground. And uh, they were very worried about this. They thought there were little green men all over the sky setting off nuclear bombs. Um, and ultimately they gave the telescopes to the astronomers uh, because there was nothing they could do with them. They gave far too many false alarms. So now we know there are, there are essentially two types of gamma ray bursts, the short ones and the long ones. The short ones are colliding neutron stars, um, and the long ones are sorts of hypernovae, um, but we don't really understand terribly well how those work. So they're like supernovae, only much, much bigger, um, but we don't really understand them very well. And one of our aims is to try and understand them a bit better. So we, we can simulate what we might expect to see. So this is a, a, a gamma ray burst that was seen with, with Fermi. Um, and uh, we said, OK, we know that it was producing emission above 30 GeV because Fermi saw that. Um, so we simulate what we might see um, with a ground-based instrument. And you get all this detail, and all this structure, we hope. Um, so this is on a 0.1 second time binning. And the space-based instrument simply cannot do that. We've actually had some success now with ground-based instruments. It was a bit of a holy grail trying to actually see these objects. Um, but uh, there was a, a gamma ray burst that was seen in 2018, I think it was, um, where actually we saw some very high energy photons from the object. So it does tell us that actually um, they really do produce very high energy, high, very high energy photons. So we're also interested in, in gamma rays from dark matter. I mean, it's called dark for a pretty good reason. Um, but actually, depending slightly on your theory, it can shine in gamma rays. You get the particles annihilating and creating gamma rays. The difficult bit is spotting it among all the other stuff that shines in gamma rays too. Um, equation, this time of night, you probably don't want an equation. But basically, what that tells you is that the number of gamma rays we get depends, OK, how long we look for, um, but also on the particle physics of the interaction, how big our detector is. and crucially um, what the energy spectrum of the gamma rays is that gets produced. So that's fine, um, but there are lots of astrophysical backgrounds. So one of the places we think is a good place to look is the center of our galaxy where there's a black hole and where we expect dark matter to accumulate. Um, but the trouble is there are big astrophysical backgrounds there. And this is a picture of the, the central 200 parsecs of the Milky Way produced by one of the current 
ground based instruments in, in gamma rays, and you can see it's kind of messy. So we're on the hunt for good places to look. The galactic center, as I said, probably isn't marvelous. Um, the halo of the Milky Way might be quite good, but there is, we know, a diffuse background of gamma rays, so that makes life a little difficult. Um, satellite galaxies um, are a possibility. We know that these dwarf galaxies, which are thought to be dominated by dark matter, which is great. So the background should be low. There shouldn't be much else producing gamma rays. And uh, they're point sources, so we can spot what they are. Um, but the trouble is, because they're a long way away, we may not see so many gamma rays from them. Um, same is also true of, of galaxy clusters, for example. We expect there should be a nice tropic contribution from the dark matter. We should be kind of bathed in it, but how we pick that out against the background, heaven knows. Um, spectral lines, you expect actually to see a, a line at the energy which corresponds to the mass of the dark matter particle. That would be great, um, but it's quite low sensitivity because you're looking at a very specific energy. So we've got a work cut out, um, but it is actually comparable with um, things like the underground dark matter experiments and uh, CERN. And in fact, we complement each other rather well and that we can probe energies that, that they can't. So I think all three of those things are going to be very important to try and pin down the dark matter ultimately. The very last thing I think I'm going to talk about is something called Lorentz invariance violation. So you're told nothing goes faster than the speed of light in a vacuum, of course. And uh, we're also told that this is uh, uniform, it's always the same, um, but it may not be. Uh, and theories of quantum gravity suggest there are time delays between photons of different energies when traveling over large distances. Uh, and this means the vacuum has a, a non-trivial refractive index, as the theorists say. If we're gonna spot this, we need objects that are luminous and distant, produce photons in some kind of outburst, so we get a time signature off them, so we can track how they're doing. Um, and um, that means what we need is a gamma ray telescope. Um, we're covering a very large number of um, orders of magnitude in energy. So CTA will cover about four orders of magnitude, makes it great for this task. Um, so that's one of the things that we would really like to, to look for. Um, so we use outbursts from active galactic nuclei probably, and um, on the top left there, you can see an outburst from a famous object called PKS 2155-304, great name. Um, and we were able to, there were so many photons from this object that we were able to split them into low energy and high energy, but we didn't quite have the resolution to be able to say, ah, oh, we can see there's a delay on the uh, high energy photons as compared with the low energy photons. We couldn't quite say that. Um, so with a better instrument, better energy resolution, and better sensitivity, we should have a better chance to see that. On the bottom left, you can see a simulation of the same event, but with the sensitivity of CTA. One of the reasons that we can do this so well is, is our sensitivity. So if you look on the top right there, you can see the sensitivity of Fermi um, with time um, and the sensitivity of CTAO, the CTA observatory with time. Um, so you can see that with one minute observation, um, CTA is what, one, two, three, four, five and a bit, nearly six orders of magnitude more sensitive than Fermi. So that means we can pick up this high speed variation that the space-based instrument cannot. So that brings me to the end, um, except to say that um, you can follow CTA on Twitter and all sorts of things. We're on Facebook um, and we have a website. So if you want to find out what's going on with these slightly bonkers people building these telescopes and then do uh, have a look. Um, it's, a, it's a worldwide collaboration. There are 31 countries and about 1500 scientists and engineers. So um, it's gonna be quite a thing when we finally do build it. <laughs> and at that point, I will stop and uh, ask for questions. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, th thank you. Thank you for this, this fascinating talk. Uh, we already have one uh, one question, so perhaps I will I will ask that while uh, some 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 more people ask some more questions. As a reminder, you should see a Q and A button uh, somewhere near near the bottom of your screen. If you click that, you should be able to type uh, in uh, your question. Uh, so uh, the first question that we received is: uh, As Ice Cube has recently 
probably discovered mm -hmm. neutrinos from a classic uh, nova. Have gamma rays been detected from a uh, classic nova by uh, ground-based telescopes? I love the probably. Uh, <laughs> we're not completely sure, of course. Um, no, is the short answer. We have not seen a classical nova with a ground-based telescope. Fermi has seen, I think, 12 of them, which isn't very many. Um, actually, um, one of one of my fourth year undergraduates did a project, which eventually he published by the time he was doing his PhD in Oxford, actually, um, looking at this question and asking, was there something special about the, the novae that are seen by Fermi? Um, and the answer actually is they're just close. Um, so with a more sensitive instrument, you should be able to see more things. So I'm expecting slash hoping um, that with the ground-based instruments, we'll start to see classical novae, but we don't see them yet. Uh, if, 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 <clears throat> so uh, yeah, there's, there's still plenty of time for uh, any, any more questions. Uh, if you're having trouble with uh, the Q&A uh, functionality, then, then feel free to, to try uh, using, using the chat. Uh, oh, uh, yes, we've got another question. Uh, uh, Okay, so, so the question is about uh, dark matter. Uh, in terms of the kind of energies you are predicting, which particles do you hypothesize are the most likely culprits for dark matter? Uh, and the person asking says, I know particles like neutrinos have been discounted. Yeah, so the, the, the culprit that's usually considered is the, um, the minimum particle from the supersymmetric models, right, which is called the neutralino. Um, normally gets a, a chi as its symbol. Um, so that's the, the current models are all based on that. But to be honest, there's a bit of a zoo of particles out there. And uh, one suggestion, of course, is that we might also have axion dark matter, which I've not really talked about. Um, but the way we would detect that is by something slightly different. Um, this would have an effect on the spectra and the propagation of gamma rays from distant objects like active galaxies, actually. Um, so the neutralino is the current one that everybody's pinning everything on, but whether that's right or not, who knows? Okay. Uh, we have two questions on, I believe, uh, which are very similar, and uh, they're, they're basically asking about the volcanic activity on La Palma, and has that affected the programme? Yeah, well, yes, it has. Um, so. The good news is that um, the telescope is safe. It's well away from the volcano and they've covered the mirrors and the motors from the dust, um, which is an issue. Um, so that's not a problem, but they were happily testing the telescopes. And of course, they've had to stop doing that. Um, so the, the large size telescope hasn't had its usual test run at the moment. Um, they they have tested it and it does work and that's great, but they were looking to do some more tests and they haven't been able to. Okay. Uh, okay, so, so we've got uh, three more questions. Uh, uh, perhaps going back to what you were uh, 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 you were talking about a little bit earlier, uh, we have a question. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about uh, the, the axion in this context? Oh, right. Okay. Um, so axion-like particles. Right. So we have a problem with the gamma rays from active galactic nuclei. Um, and it's that we see more of them than you might expect. Now, um, we know we get absorption on something called the extra galactic background light. So uh, this is the light produced by all the stars since the start of the universe, right? Uh, we know you get that, um, but we don't seem to see quite enough absorption. Now, it could be that the cosmologists are wrong, and this is something I'm always very happy to suggest. Um, but it's also possible it's something related to physics, and it may be the axions the, the source of the trouble. So it's postulated that um, axion-like particles, we have to be precise about this for the particle physicists, axion-like particles um, can convert two photons in a magnetic field, right, and vice versa. So the idea is that the photons get produced in an active galaxy, they get turned into axions that are then able to propagate to us without worrying about the extra galactic background light. They then get to our galaxy, meet our galaxy's magnetic field and turn back into photons where we detect them. 
right? Um, and so this is the suggestion as to why perhaps we're seeing more gamma rays from these objects than we might expect. Now, at the moment, numbers of objects that we see are quite limited. Um, and so it's very hard to say whether we're actually seeing this effect or not, right? So that's one thing. There's also something in, in relation to um, magnetars, uh, which are extremely um, highly magnetized pulsars um, and their detection or otherwise in gamma rays as well. And this also gives you a hint on whether you can see um, axions or not. Um, and actually, uh, at low energies, you can do some rather interesting stuff. One of my uh, now ex PhD students actually did some very nice work getting limits on the mass of the axion using really quite old gamma ray data from these highly magnetized pulsars um, that were better or at least comparable with um, an experiment at CERN that did cost quite a lot of money. So we were quite pleased with that. <laughs> Uh, uh, excellent, thank you. Uh, uh, another question, um, uh, again about the practicalities. Uh, how did you choose the main and backup sites? Ah, that's a really good question. It's very complex. So for gamma ray telescopes, there's a sweet spot, which is around about two kilometers above sea level. Okay, so that's our first requirement. It's a sweet spot because we clearly have to have some atmosphere above us for the interactions to take place. Uh, but we don't want so much atmosphere above us that we end up with lots of tranquil radiation being absorbed. So around two kilometers above sea level is good. So that's the first thing we needed. The second thing we needed was some uh, with enough space for an array of telescopes. So a really pointy mountain is not terribly helpful um, because there's not enough room up there. Um, and indeed, actually, I think in an ideal world, we might have gone for somewhere roomier than La Palma. That's, that's my personal opinion. <laughs> um, but... Um, the other thing that you also need is, is infrastructure, all right? And while the site in Namibia in particular was a really great site, um, there was no infrastructure. So you end up having to put in your own roads, power cables and so on. Whereas La Palma and Chile, a lot of that infrastructure was available close by, even if not you know, next to you. Um, so that coupled with, of course, good weather, um, which these sites have, um, what you lead you to, to choose to go where you, you ultimately go, right? It's never a simple, that's the best skies, let's go there. It doesn't always work that way. Okay. Uh, there's uh, one more question in, in the chat. I, I also saw with some Vietnamese uh, uh, raising their hands. Uh, if, 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 if you have a question, do, do feel free to, to type it either in the Q&A uh, or, or in, the, in the chat and we'll, we'll get to it. But the question in the chat that we have now is, can you say a bit about the detection of neutrinos by Cherenkov radiation? Ah, okay, so neutrinos not quite my thing. Right, um, so neutrinos, as you probably know, um, pass through most things, including mostly the entire Earth. Um, they really don't interact with much at all. Uh, but occasionally one will react. And uh, when it does so, it produces muons. And those muons are charged particles. Uh, and these are what create the Cherenkov radiation for neutrino detectors. Uh, neutrino detectors, however, are in general in water or ice. Um, so there's KM3Net, which is currently under construction in the Mediterranean. And that's obviously in water. Um, and there's something called Ice Cube, um, which uh, one of our questions referred to earlier, um, which is at the South Pole. The peculiar thing about these detectors is that because they're actually looking for um, the neutrinos and neutrinos can come through the air, what they look for, what they call upward going muons. So these are things that are not coming down from above, but are coming up from the bottom. Um, and they know they have to be neutrinos uh, because the cosmic rays are all coming down from above. Um, so that's what they actually look for. So Ice Cube actually is looking at the Northern Hemisphere sky and the Northern Hemisphere instrument KM3Net is actually looking at the Southern Hemisphere sky, just to confuse you. Hey, it, it looks like uh, those, oh, uh, uh, there is one more question. Uh, uh, when will uh, when would you be fully operational? Is there Ooh. an expected <laughs> lifetime for the for the system? Will, will we ever? No. Um, so obviously the pandemic has slowed us down a bit, like it slowed everybody down a bit. Um, so we're hoping to have the alpha array constructed by 
hmm, I think it's 2025. And um, so the Alpha Ray is the first bit. So we've got enough money to build our first telescopes on the ground. Um, so we, we do that. Um, I think actually by fingers crossed 2024, we probably have something that's more sensitive than anything that currently exists. Um, and you could make some partial observations with that. Um, then hopefully over time we accumulate a bit more money maybe. Um, we've already had some very good news from the Americans who look like they're gonna be chipping in. So fingers crossed there. Um, so that would be uh, a little bit longer, I think. Um, lifetime, hmm, 30 years, something like that. I guess it'll, it'll outlast me, I hope. <laughs> okay. Uh, I, oh, uh, I, I think there's one more question, which I think we can probably just about squeeze in. Uh, do, do, do. Uh, so we will the, uh, sorry, for, so will the observations be able to measure or infer a accretion rate a for active galactic nuclei a, a, and what can we learn from this? Hmm. Yes, um, probably. So the emission from accretion mostly is x-rays, right? Because it's mostly because the stuff is hot. And what we tend to see is the jet emission, but we assume that the accretion and the jet emission are linked. They have to be, right? What comes in has to be related to what pops out. Um, so we assume there's a relationship there. So yes, in terms of the kinds of um, rapidity with which we see the variation in the emission, for example, um, it tells us something about what's going on in the jet, which in turn should tell us about the accretion rates um, onto the black hole. Um, what that tells us about the actual physics of the accretion, um, not so sure, actually, if I'm honest. Um, I'm not so much interested in the accretion, I tend to worry about the jets, but there, there clearly is a connection. Okay. I think we have uh, come to, 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 to the end. Uh, thank, you, thank you everyone for attending and thank you for all your fascinating questions. And um, thank you again, Professor Chadwick, for a, a, a really, really fascinating uh, talk. It's, uh, it, 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 was, it, was, it was really, really wonderful. Uh, and uh, it, 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 it was great to hear you talk about a, a subject that you are clearly very, very passionate about. Uh, yeah, um, it's been a pleasure. It's always uh, nice to be given free reign to go on for ages about what you do. <laughs> Never ask if this is what they do. <laughs> Uh, and uh, our next talk will be in January uh, at the Lytton Field in Newcastle about the James Webb uh, Space Telescope. Uh, you can find full details about that. So you will be able to find full details about that uh, on our website very shortly. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you all for coming. Uh, have, a, have a very nice evening. Uh, goodbye. <laughs>